I really didn't have no good input, you know, from my family about my music. And my mom used to tell me I wasn't going to be nothing. She'd tell me, you know, what do you think you're going to be, a rock star and all this stuff? There ain't nobody really writes like a star like me. I mean, I mean, you go out and copy my style, and you ask it, but it won't, won't really be me. It was kind of dark and gloomy, and really, only friend I really had was Wesley Everett. That was pretty much it, and we just kind of did our own thing, you know. All my parents really get me get down on it because I write them kind of songs, but they don't really understand. Like some, I mean, music is my music is basically my life, and it's like, I mean, that's all I live for. This is like music I was doing inside my room, and I really didn't have no friends at the time, and I wrote, you know. It's just too overwhelming still today when people tell me they like my music and they love it. It's still kind of overwhelming. It's kind of kind of almost hard to believe, you know, because I'm like, like a, this is my room right, right here. I'm like sitting by myself, you know, just writing this stuff, and people probably think I party all the time and go places, man. Peter's best friend growing up, when he, in the super early days was Wesley. Wes the best, he called him. When I turned 13, and that's when I first met him, he was drawing up like, monsters and stuff like that, creatures, zombies, stuff like that. I remember he used to carry around a Freddy hand, and he had them in the swimming pool and shit, and I just went up and talked to him. I said, yeah, you're the one that, you know, had that teacher in the headlock. Wes did some recordings of his own and stuff, too. He sang, and then when I come in and I sang, too, I say something some some perverted to go with it. They both went to the psycho ed school that Peter called the grounds of insanity. Let's know I got a cop picked me up, put me in what he said. Let's know he was going there too. After I got out, I, they had me so screwed up on drugs and everything, and then they stuck me back in there, and I slammed my head into this bar, and then they sent me to Rome State Hospital. Growing up in Dalton, Georgia, we had the. We kind of had to fight for our meals. And that's when I started drinking. I, I first had my, brought Jim Bean. And we kind of had to kill. I swallowed that stuff down. Like that, and I was like, ooh, this is like a quick fix. And puppies and kitty cats and shit, they're, they're no goddamn exception. was the Blueberry Masturbator comp, uh, which was incredible, blew my mind. There's somebody in San Francisco right now with an acoustic guitar playing a Peter Stubbs song, probably. We went on a, a cross-country tour after that and just went nuts on that tape. Like, all of us were like, holy mother, like, this is so good. I'd never seen anyone kind of, like, be able to play folky music and be saying, like, the filthy, honest things that he's saying. So it definitely spread, like, throughout the whole country, probably pretty rapidly. <laughs> when you're working in the field, so to speak, of a rural, small southern town, it can be hard just to express an idea. That's a rainbow fountain from hell, boys. First time I ever came to Dalton, Georgia, I met Peter Stowe. And I remember the drive there was like, oh my God, where the hell are we going? It was like, it's getting dark and it was there was nothing out. It was just all like land. <laughs> which I'm not used to in Miami. It was in the middle of winter. It was, it was New Year's Day, 1994. He was already there, and he was wearing something weird. Like, I think it was like this all-white outfit or something, not normal. And he had this fake blood all over him, and he was just like, hey, how you doing? Hi, y'all. And there came a point where Peter played, and Peter was wearing a jock strap, nothing else. It was fucking cold as shit. The riffs were kind of simple, but like so melodic, and his voice was incredible. I was freezing, I was miserable. 
but it was like the best misery I've ever went through in my life. It was a good show. A lot of Peter's early songs were about food. Oh, don't you know, oh, gotta have my sloppy joe. She always had a little thing with, you know, food. He, he always loved, uh, he always loved to sing about food, like uh, Spice Cream Corn. It's a great song. Later on, that love would turn to a, <laughs> turn to a more physical nature. Once I heard him tell the tale of fucking a can of cranberry sauce, and he said after he got done fucking this can of cranberry sauce, his dick felt heavy. <laughs> and from now on, I call him Cranberries. Funny as it is, the fornication within was awesome. Most of all I did was record tapes and kind of keep them to myself. Uh, I just recorded like you know the, all them tapes I was telling y'all about. He had a stuffed animal. It's a blue. It's a blue monster. Pet monster was the bass drum. Um, some folks probably remember what a pet monster was, but it was a big stuffed animal. It was pretty weird. He'd ask me and my friend Alan to come over and play on the record, and he wanted me to bring a tambourine, and he wanted my friend Alan to bring a cymbal, just one cymbal. Get a stick, hit it on its belly, that was the bass drum. Then he had different sized butter bowls, maybe some mason jars or whatever. So I played tambourine on my lap, and my friend Alan played one cymbal. Ting, ting. We were like, this guy is fucking out of his mind. I brought two, two uh, bass drums, right? And I had this huge kit, you know, I was big in the Slayer, still am. And of course it sounded great, in an out of my mind kind of way. You see, some of the names I went by would be Retardo. That was like 1988. Cheesy Dwayne, Corn Dog Joe, Gary Spit. That was more gospel. Cannibalist Guitar, Grasshopper McClain. That ain't last too long. Then I went to Peter Stubb Love Machine. You remember that? Coon Durango, Ed Scream. Okay, I'm near Gary kind of when I was kind of going redneck way and I wanted something to kind of fit it. Gary League, Gary Spit, Gary Lee Austin. And then 93 is when Peter Stubb came around. That was like January. Peter Stubb, he's, he's kind of like Charlie Manson in a way. It's, he's Jesus, he's Satan, and he's confused. My name is Stephanie Everett and I'm Peter's ex-wife. We were married for three years. And this is our son, LaRogue. He was born in 96. This song about my ex wife. <laughs> uh, let me tell you a story about this. I wrote up all these fucked up songs by my ex wife. For some reason, I was getting sick. <laughs> I wasn't on my medication, the right medication, and some reason it was making me sick, and I was falling back in love with her. I mean, it just fucked me over. We was walking, he's like, Do you see that cliff? And it was just regular ground. And so he got in the car and he started like jerking really bad, and that was the first time I ever noticed been around anyone that didn't overdose. So I took him to the hospital and he made me know to take him. So we went to Aaron Nelson's house that night. Like a drug you are, like a drug you are. Roland, you're just like a drug. Like a drug you are, like a drug you are. Roland, you're just like a drug. Like a drug you are, like a drug you are. I really enjoyed being around him when he sung to me because I never had anyone sing to me before. So he was, he was different. But it really all changed, like, for me when the Peter Stubb album came out, a four song demo, and he decided to change his name to Peter Stubb from some old werewolf tale or something, you know? To me, when he gets drunk, I think it's because of medicine. He has totally different. Uh, I think it's like the bad side of him comes out. The werewolf inside Peter Stubb coming out. Because, <laughs> I don't know. I, would you say he's maybe really a werewolf? He is. It comes out instead of the man. It comes out with, with the alcohol. That's when he truly just, like, musically and like vocally just kind of went over the top, you know. 
and then that's when I, I think at the same time is when a lot of people really started getting into him. He was like, wow, you're my fan, you're a fan of my music, and he just took a Bowie knife and started cutting the hell out of his arm, and then he gave it to me, like, here you go, there's a gift. If you really know about who the character really was, you'll be like, you know, God damn, you know, like, You'll be like, why didn't he even take that name from that person? And it's almost like it's been some kind of bad omen on me. Because you really fucked me up. You fucked me up. You fucked me up. When Peter became a Nazi skinhead, that definitely blew my mind. He came up to a house that we had and was talking all this shit about, you know, the white race and carrying on about all this shit. You really fucked me up. Peter's very impressionable. I mean, everybody is to a certain extent, but if you're just around a bunch of bullshit all the time, you know, you pick up some shit. Maybe, like, becoming racist was, like, you know, some way of him, like, fitting in with these weird people he'd have to live around, these weird neighbors, because he, everyone had moved away and he didn't have any old friends. He came up and said he just wanted to tell me that he wasn't like that. It was a mistake that he was sorry. I really never saw him during that period. I guess he knew that a lot of people didn't really want to hang out with him. I didn't want to see him. I didn't want to talk to him. He knew that we were pretty opposed to that. Oh! Fuck, white Fuck white America! I played with him um, quite a few times, but never recorded anything. And he calls me up one day and says, uh, I want to record an album called Sunray Drive. And that, he was gonna he was gonna kill himself there. Maybe a year or six months after the Peter Stubb tape came out, they put him back in the mental hospital. And that's when he started getting really heavily suicidal. He had sing about it in the past, but he never really acted on it. So well, Peter, Peter gets obsessed with these shadow demons that jump in his body, and the only way he can get them out is to cut them out. This is after, unfortunately, after Peter has like lots of cuts on his arms, you know, self-inflicted. And I remember the lady behind the the counter was like, "Lord, honey, what happened to your arms?" And he was like, "That's the attack of the psychotic demons." We walked outside, and he was all laughing. He was like. <laughs> Yeah, that freaked her out, didn't it? And I was like, yeah, it's pretty freaky, you know? And he goes, well, I wasn't gonna lie. He always sing a lot about demons inside of him, which, you know, I, I guess is you know, metaphorical. Well, it kind of pissed me off, you know, because I got kids of my own. He called me up one morning and said, uh, my mom got real mad at me. I was like, why is that? He said, because um, she came in the house and, uh, I'd cut up my arms a bunch, and uh, and I got LaRoque and covered him in my, my own blood and just painted this little one-year-old kid up. And I was like, dude, what the fuck, you know? Kind of bullshit doing that to a little kid, you know? But, I don't know, some bullshit, I guess. That, that the horror is real is, uh, is a little unsettling at times. He was telling me about when he first started seeing them, and I think the first time he said he was frightened, but after that, because he was, you know, he was a loner and he always was in his bedroom, they became like friends. We all have demons. I have demons. We're all wolves. We're all killers. This is gonna sound kind of hokey, but I guess it kind of makes you kind of care for him more because he, he needed people to be around him. He needed to come out of that damn bedroom and have friends, you know, like a normal person. And I think it was I think it was good for him to get out there and, and see because he did have he does have a talent. 
and to get out there and show people, you know, what's been hiding on the other side of town, you know, and rocking back and forth in a bedroom. Y'all having fun? Yeah! All right, here we go. Where are you? I need you. Are you gonna come? I sit by the phone, but it never rings. Want to hear your voice on the other end? Tell me, darling, are we still friends? Got to know. Yes, I want to know. There was a lot of people that came up to me and kept saying that your dad was great, and they just kept coming up to me. I think I just got too nervous because it'd been like a year and a half. And, yeah, no. and I wasn't drinking. Yeah, that. Drinking calms down my nerves, but I did a good thing about not drinking because if I would have drunk, I would have been sick today. Yeah, I've been real sick today. <coughs> and uh, I think that's pretty much Did you enjoy the death metal stuff? Yeah, was Death metal was pretty good. Yeah, that was the best part. When you're somebody that nobody else wants to take the time to deal with because I guess they're too busy, too caught up in what they got going on. They're gonna live, I guess, sort of like in a fantasy world. They gotta create their own reality. And I just basically took this Peter Stubb and turned him into like a comic book character. It was really strange, you know, and now I think it's time to end that character, you know, finally just say, uh, you know, it's done, it's over with. People, you know, Peter Stubb is dead. The new shit he has, he's got a Stormtrooper Santa. That's an awesome song, man. There was a real old St. Nick. I guess most of y'all should know that. Learn that from A&E. I think it's pretty weird in <laughs> the same closet, but he's, he's always been different anyways. It's like a really cool feeling, you know. I, I just can't describe it. It's like a, you know, it's getting ready to come and stuff. You just real excited. Like right now, see what, September? October, November, we'll see three more months. So. Feel the joy in my head, in my mind. Christmas comes every day, every night. Feelings of sugar plums dancing in my head. It was really strange how I survived like that, but I did. You know, I sit around and listen to the King Diamond albums and stuff, so. I bet, you know, I can't complain. I was, I was alive, you know, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't doing any kind of drugs. In some ways, I kind of like to, that innocent time, I'd kind of like to take that back a little bit. Every day. Go boys and girls, every day Christmas. One teacher asked me 